morning. I'm going to call to order the April 20th, 2021 meeting of the Carroll County Planning and Zoning Commission. Could we please establish a quorum? Hi, good morning. Ms. Sheetwood? Here. Mr. Hoff? Mr. Canale? Here. Mr. Wathers? I'm here. Ms. Kirchner? Here. Mr. Lester? Mr. Bassnell? Here. Commissioner Wamp? Good morning. Hi. Secretary Eisenberg? Here. Mr. Chair, please let the record reflect that six members are present and we do have a quorum. Thank you. Move on to the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, up next is our review and approval of agenda. Are there any changes to our agenda? No, there are no changes. It is as listed. This is Jeff. I will move approval of the agenda. Dean Canelli will second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Next is the review and approval of minutes from March 16th and March 31st. Any changes to those meeting minutes? Doesn't appear so. This is Jeff, I'll move approval of the minutes from March 16th to March 31st, 2021. All second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. On to the commission member reports. Um, since our last meeting, I approved three plans. Um, M20-0066 Jonesville Acres, which was a minor subdivision of one new lot uh, south of Westminster. FX-20003 Klaus, Klaus Farm. Subdivision to create seven residential lots on White Rock Road. M20033 Justin's Domain, which is another minor subdivision of one new lot in an area north of Westminster. Commissioner, would you like to say anything? Good morning. How's my sound? Am I loud and clear? Good. Okay. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Uh, just a few quick things for me. As most of you know, we are uh, deep into the budget, and the hope is that it will be wrapped up uh, later this afternoon. I will remind folks that Carroll County does it unlike most other jurisdictions where we are in front of the camera the whole time and we balance one plus five years of additional uh, in an attempt to try to, to, to get those out years balanced as well. That's a tough, tough challenge uh, and we're doing the best that we can and I don't know that we'll get there this year due to uh, a lot of uncertainty. Uh, but, I, but again, I will remind folks that as you watch county executives around our region roll out their budgets, they did it all behind closed doors and pull it out and say, here it is. We in Carroll do it entirely in front of the camera. Some of the things that the planning and zoning folks will be most uh, interested in, we had some one-time extra money. We're gonna do some infrastructure improvements I know that there are two roadways in Eldersburg that are now in the budget. One of those is riding our way, and the other is Georgetown Boulevard. Both of those will be addressed in, in uh, the coming years. And staff also put together a plan uh, that would eliminate all gravel roads within three years with uh, a, a, a stone uh, and chip surface. That is also in the budget. So we are anticipating that by year 2025, we will no longer have any gravel roads in Carroll. Uh, the, the, um, the theme this year has, has been all get some, and that's what we are trying to do with the budget. Uh, the last thing I have, uh, I think we talked the last time that we were gonna attempt to try to get the building open by May the 1st, uh, certainly to respect our employees and those that work here, most of them have gotten their first shots uh, within the last week. They'll be getting their second shots mid-May, and then two weeks after that, they will be considered 
fully vaccinated as a result of the results of the uh, vaccination. So we're now shooting for June 1 to get this building open in some uh, manner and getting back to some kind of normalcy with meetings. Uh, with that, I always thank everyone for serving on these, on these uh, boards and commissions. We truly do appreciate all of the efforts that all of you do because it's tough to find folks that wanna serve. So thank you all for stepping up. Thank you, Madam Chair. That's all that I've got and good morning. Thank you. Um, actually, I'm, I'm very pleasantly pleased to hear the two roadways that we specifically thing and also the uh, gravel roadways because there are actually quite a few that are within a couple miles of my house. So that'll be a, a great change. Um, thank you. Any other commission members like to say anything at this time? Okay. Now we'll move on to administrative report. Secretary Eisenberg. Good morning, everyone. And yes, planning is beyond thrilled that right now we're in Georgetown or in the um, budget as of now. So we really do appreciate that. It'll go a long way um, in helping congestion and traffic and safety in that area. So that is really great and exciting news. So thank you all too for all your work on helping to prepare the CIP letter for this year that went to the commissioners. Um, just a few things, uh, kind of in that same vein of transportation. As you know, we did a consulting study using grant money last year for a transportation master plan for Carroll County. We do not have a transportation master plan for the county. We have a major roads plan that was from 1964 and we've included transportation elements in all of our planning documents, but we've never done a comprehensive approach. So using consultant um, grant money for uh, hiring a consultant, we looked at the main corridors. If you recall, Hunt and Mead came to a planning commission meeting and um, went over what their uh, product was and the different corridors that they looked at. The idea behind this is to help us prioritize um, looking at what roadways have the most issues, um, how to prioritize it for the uh, Consolidated Transportation Plan annual letter that we prepare and send to MDOT and get the support of our delegation. So with that being said, we're going to take that information and now roll it into the Transportation Master Plan that staff is working on currently. And to kick that off, the first thing that we're doing, and you'll hear more about this as we move on in the coming months, is a, just a general survey uh, to the community. Um, it'll be launched officially May 1, though it's on our website now, looking at um, where people see issues in their daily commutes, either to work or school, um, and, and on the weekends when they're running their errands. So it's just a very high level survey, just to garner interest into the plan and get ideas of where people see issues um, with our transportation system, mainly our roads within Carroll County. So wanted to make you all aware of that. Um, and that's all I have for my report. Are there any questions regarding that? Okay, if not, I'm gonna go ahead and move on to extensions with Laura Matthias. Good morning, everybody. All right. I have four extensions to report to you today since our last planning commission meeting. The first one is M09025 Walker Wood Estates 2. This is the 10th extension. It is a minor subdivision, two lots, and it is in commissioner district number one. The second one is M14011 Runway Estates. This is also a two lot minor subdivision. This is the first extension request and it's also in commissioner district number one. The next one is Fern Hill. The file number is P02053. This is 17 lot subdivision and is the 10th extension request. It is in Commissioner District Number 5. And the final extension is Hummingbird Hill, P12004. 
the fourth extension for this project, and it is in Commissioner District Number One. And that is everything for extensions. Thank you. All right, thank you, Laura. Next, Hannah Weber just wants to inform you of the upcoming BZA cases. Hannah. Good morning, everybody. The BZA has a hearing on April 28th, and I reviewed three cases for this hearing. Case 6310, Rebecca Rawson. This was a conditional use for a commercial kennel on 77 acres. This was located along Runkles Road and Mount Airy, Election District 4, zoned conservation, and we found it to be consistent. The second case is case 6314, Lawn Lucas. This is for a conditional use for a farm alcohol producer, as well as a distance and a lot size variance on 2.3 acres. This is located along Alicia Road in Manchester, Election District 1. This was zoned agriculture and also found to be consistent. The last case is case 6315, Baltimore Homa Community. This was another conditional use for a retreat center on 29 acres. This was located along Pool Road in Westminster, Election District 3, zoned conservation and also found to be consistent. And that's it. All right, thank you so much, Hannah. Um, and that concludes my administrative report for today. Are there any other questions or comments? Thank you. Um, with that, we'll move on to item number eight, which is our town manual presentation. Uh, Hannah, again. Yeah, welcome back. Heck. Let me do a brief introduction here, Hannah, if you wouldn't mind. So I, yep. I can't remember if we told you all or not, but basically um, we have prepared a manual, so to speak, for our municipalities. Over the last, I would even say several years, many of your municipalities had changed over and staff from the town administrator um, and town planners. Some towns don't even have planners assigned to them. They have other staff that um, may not be planning professionals that do a lot of the planning and zoning work for a municipality because they're small. They just don't have uh, the bandwidth to, to be able to have all of those different positions filled. So one thing that we have um, come across is kind of a misunderstanding of what we do for the towns from a planning perspective and how to um, do like an annexation process, a water and sewer amendment. So we thought it would be helpful given all this, uh, the new staff and new staff to us as well, um, to create a manual for the municipalities on planning related items, things that they would have to process through the county, items that would go to the state to help them um, have a smooth process moving forward and so that they understand how we assist the towns and what they can expect from our staff and how to run the process through um, the state law is it has a requirement for those. So Hannah's just going to give you a very high level presentation of the town manual. These manuals have been sent in hard and electronic copy to each municipality. We worked very closely with development review so that way we could help, help towns uh, go through our particular development review process um, as well as this is posted on our website. So the idea is to give them kind of one-stop shopping of resources as they do their planning processes within each municipality. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Hannah now. She did a great job and really thorough working on this with everyone. So thank you. Go ahead, Hannah. Thanks, Linda. Um, if I could have the presenting. Um, okay, is it everyone able to see my screen? Okay, so as Linda said, we prepared this manual for both our staff as well as the municipality's planning staff, and we titled it a guide to county and municipal planning processes. So as Linda also said, the purpose of this guide is to provide a guide for municipal staff and officials on the county's planning related role in assisting and collaborating on various plans, projects, and planning related state mandates. 
The plan is to have this manual updated on a yearly basis. And when um, these updates are made, they will reflect any changes throughout the year. And then we will redistribute the manual to all the municipalities. One of the main functions between the county, our county planning department and the municipalities is the county liaison to the municipalities. And here you can kind of see how our de department divides up the municipalities amongst our four planners. So each planner has a set of municipalities and with these municipalities, they're responsible for attending the monthly planning commission meetings where they provide updates on what's going on with our department. And we also review the development projects that come in for this municipality. And we also serve as the first point of contact for the town with questions they have regarding planning related matters. So there are many projects and processes covered in the manual and we split the manual into three different sections. The first section being town to county processes. This includes annexations, water and sewer amendments in the triennial update, review development plans in the state consolidated transportation program. The second section being general reports. This includes the annual report, master plan updates for both the county and municipal master plans and then the transportation master plan. The last section is the town county agreements language. We didn't include the entire town county agreements, but only language that was referenced throughout the manual. So that would be only language that has to deal with planning and development related matters. So within each topic, we explained what the project or process is, how the municipality is involved, and if they need further resources, I listed links that were found on the county website from both our department and the Bureau of Development Review, and also some flow charts that um, will make the process easier to follow along with. So here is the flow chart for municipal annexations, and this is the flow chart for water and sewer amendments. And that's it. Do you guys have any questions? So this is uh, Jeff Weathers. One, uh, Hannah, I wanted to say this is great. I read the manual. And even though I've been on this commission for, I think, seven years, um, I learned lots of stuff here, um, filled in some gaps for me. So number one, kudos. I think it's really helpful. Um, two, is it possible that I, while we have an electronic version, being as old as I am, sometimes I like things in paper form. Is it possible that we could get any of us that wanted at least a, um, get on the mailing list and get a hard copy of this? I think it's a great reference material. Yeah, I would think so. We have extra copies in the office. Absolutely, we can print out a copy for anyone who wants one. We didn't want to inundate you all with paper, but absolutely, if each member would like one, we're happy to mail it out in a packet to you all. Well, I'd like one, so put me down. Thank you. Nice job. Now, I have a question. This, this is just the towns, but have we thought to also maybe include some community groups as part of this planning, um, this manual or anything like that? We have not. Um, the reason we did it with the towns is because we actually have a formal agreement, as Hannah said, through the county town agreement. So that outlines what our resp mutual responsibilities are to each other. So what this does is help walk them through the process. Um, we're more than happy to provide this same information to our community groups, but because they don't have planning jurisdiction for their specific community, they liaise with us and we go to their meetings, they don't process these types of items. Okay, thank you. And and I would like a hard copy too, please. Any other questions at this time? Doesn't appear so. Thank you, Hannah. Okay. Thanks everybody. We'll move on to item number nine, the water and sewer spring amendment, discussion and certification. Price. Good morning. Uh, if I could have control to share my screen, please.
everybody see the presentation? Thank you. All right, good morning. This is the certification for the spring amendment that I talked about, uh, I believe it was two weeks ago. And there's been a couple of, one major change that occurred. And this change is excuse me, that uh, the city of Westminster has removed their request for an amendment. So right now it's just for the Freedom Sykesville Water and Sewer Service Area and the Town of Manchester Water Service Area. Sort of as a reminder uh, for the Freedom Sewer Service Area, we have a 7414 Brangles Road, which is a request on behalf of the owner to include this property into the priority service area. Uh, they're looking to subdivide the property and they're currently in the, the process. There's one existing house with the potential for three new uh, units. So this could would add potentially remove 4,000 gallons per day, four units times 250 gallons per unit to the plan. Secondly is Barclow Road, uh, Barclow Properties. This is a request from the engineer on behalf of the owner again to remove this property from the Freedom Priority Service Area for sewer. Upon them looking, it's cost prohibitive for them to develop this own sewer as gravity flow is not possible and a pump station would be needed. So this would actually reduce the amount of demand on the service area by 2,500 gallons. So that lot could potentially have 10 units, so 10 units times 250. And then finally is the Sykesville area, is the Sykesville annexation. There's multiple properties that are potentially being annexed in, but this takes, this is three properties that is actually being looked at. So here's the Brangles Road property right here. And here's the existing gravity sewer line that runs right adjacent to the property. And then you actually have the pressurized main line. So this is property, here's an existing house. And then they are looking to subdivide again into three additional lots. Bartholo Road properties. Here is the property, as you can see down here, you have the gravity flow, gravity line, as well as the, and here's the actual pump station that's county owned for this area. But they would have to have a pump station to get to the gravity system. So this area, they realized is cost inefficient. So they requested to be removed from the sewer service area. And in the Sykesville annexation, there's three areas, one large property, which is partially in the existing service area. And this portion is in the future service area and they're looking to be brought into priority. This part, again, this property is split with existing and priority. And this property is, I'm sorry, existing and future. And this property is future. So we're looking to potentially bring in Three, three areas is make it cohesive. So should this property be built upon, they'll be able to just tie right into the system. And the same with this, this property right here. As you'll see, the existing gravity line runs down through uh, property C and B, and it is adjacent to property A. And on the overall map, Barthelow Road is up here in the northern section of the Freedom area. You have the Sykesville annexation area down here in the south southern section. And then this area right over here is the, is the Brangles Road in the southeast portion. So once all is done in the table 32, this shows the reduction and a little bit of addition. So the capacity, demand for capacity has gone down just a little bit, uh, roughly I think a thousand gallons total, maybe 2000 gallons total. So our total demand went down just a little bit uh, for priority, which flows into the future planning area. Now for map and table amendments for the water service area, uh, we have 
2906 Hanover Pike. Uh, this is a request, as you may remember, by the town of Manchester to remove the property from the existing service area. Uh, the property is currently on well and septic, and the well, if it hasn't already, is beginning to fail. And connecting to existing the water system is cost prohibitive. Uh, one, this the actual property is outside the town limits, and the town does not serve uh, water and sewer outside their municipal boundaries. Uh, secondly, obviously, if they wanted to be on water, on water and or sewer, they would need to annex in, and annexation would be quite expensive for this, this property owner. And then, of course, the air connection fees and all that to actually tie into the system. So we worked with the health department and the town, and they've requested to be removed out of this. And before um, Lee Roderick retired, he and I talked back and forth, and I sent them the sent him the information pertaining to the town asking uh, sent, asking for removal via application. He noted that and started the process for the permit for them to actually be able to dig a new well on that property. The Sykesville is the same three properties in Sykesville, uh, looking to actually you know, make it so the properties are an existing priority versus existing in future. Here's the property in Manchester, uh, Hanover Pike. Here is um, the high school right here, Manchester Valley High. So this property would abut three, two properties that are currently in long range. And this property would go from existing to long range in the water service area. Again, here's overall picture of Manchester water service area of what that have to look like once they are removed from certification. And finally, the three properties again in the Sykesville annexation, existing water, future water, existing water, future, and then future. This is just to bring them into the priority water service area in order because especially property A is looking to build five units uh, on water and sewer. So this will bring this whole property into the water sewer service area and they'll be able to move forward in finalizing their potential uh, construction or development of this property on lot A. Again, here is what it looks like down here. And again, the water table, the Freedom Sykesville table moves a little bit. I did include the Manchester table on here because the, the amount of water recoup is so minimal, the numbers do not move um, depending on the decimal points. So the numbers will look exactly the same even though they are recouping roughly 250 gallons of potential demand. So we've updated the water and sewer maps, uh, the demand tables for both. And MDE is in the process of doing their draft review and so far I've not received any comments. I uh, did talk with MDE last week and they didn't mention anything that sounded out of the ordinary. So I might expect anything major or if anything at all from MDE. So the next steps after today, um, the, today's certification that this, this plan is consistent with the, the master plan for the county as well as the freedom uh, community plan, which was adopted in 2018. Uh, the next step would be to brief the Board of County Commission, which we have on their agenda for Thursday, and request the County Commission to move to a public hearing, which would be held May 13th. So what we are asking today is any discussion, any questions you have, I'm happy to answer, but um, for the Planning Commission to find us consistent with the master plan, the Carroll County master plan, which was uh, amended in 2019, as well as the 2018 Freedom Community Plan, and recommend forwarding it, this to the Board of County Commissions for their adoption after public hearing. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Uh, this is Jeff. 
so as I understand it, Price, you need us to um, move, I guess, make a motion that this is consistent with the Carroll County Master Plan as amended in 2019 and the 2018 Freedom Plan and forward it to the Board of County Commissioner for adoption. Yes, that's correct. Sure. Public hearing, is that right? Yes. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second to uh, approve the amendment and send it to the commissioners as stated. Just a roll call. Can I just do a voice vote? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Okay, so with that, our next item is a recess, and I imagine it's so people can call in because we do have a site plan next for public comment. So if anybody is wishing to make a comment on the next item on our agenda, you can please call in now, and we'll take what a ten about a ten minute break. Come back around nine forty, and go ahead, move forward.
We'll move, we're going to move on to item number 11, the final site plan for S20002. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Laura Matthias with the Bureau of Development Review. And yes, S20002 is a project entitled 44 Liberty Road Retirement Community. And while the control room is giving me the screen share capability, if I saw a few people um, in conjunction with the project that are on here today, I believe CLSI is represented today as well. Yes, Jeff Ziegler is here as well as Mr. Perone and Mr. Toth. If you gentlemen would like to say hello while I'm working on the screen share, that would be great. Introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Jeff Ziegler, CLSI. Hi, I'm Nick Perone uh, with 44 Liberty, Lou, Toth, and I, our partners. Hello, I'm Lou Toth. Hope you got that message. Perfect. Okay. Thank you all. All right, wonderful. So we are here today. You will all recall this project as you actually just saw it as a concept plan back in June of 2020. It was in front of you. And there was um, minimal discussion, a bit of discussion. And since then, the... Um, engineer developer has addressed some of your comments that were made at that meeting. So we'll we'll run through the entirety of where we are and what's going on just to refresh everybody's memory. The project site is located along Liberty Road Route 26, just east of Cleas Mill Road. You'll see there there are a cluster of properties here that are within the C2 zoning district. So we are right here. Um, make it bigger, more beautiful. There we go. And hopefully, yes, hopefully we're still functioning there. Um, so we are right um, in, in between Century High School and Liberty Road, the site. It is 3.81 acres. There is an existing house on the site, which will be demolished and the wells and septic um, abandoned in conjunction with the health department. some photo images. And the proposal. So the current proposal, actually, you'll remember this has been through uh, a few iterations um, before it made its way to you in June, this, this in 2020. Um, it was initially, I had an approval for a planned business center on the site. And in conjunction with that, the property had established easements over Century High School property to utilize, um, to connect water out to Ronsdale and sewer to a line that exists on the school property. So those were already in place with that previous plan. Um, and then this plan now, when this plan gets approved, the old plan, which is an S07 plan for that planned business center um, will become void. Okay, and you'll see that in the conditions of approval as we walk through. So at this point in time, the proposal is a retirement community. So age 55 plus, these are independent living units in three separate buildings. You'll see how it's laid out on the site. So the three buildings are 48 feet in height. One of the buildings is 18 units. The second one is 18 units, and the third one has 19 units within it. All right. Per the C2 zoning, um, there's no density calculation for retirement homes age restricted in this zoning district. And per the trip generation, the traffic study was not required. And you'll hear as we go through this, um, there is there are some improvements SHA is requiring along 26. So we have a single entrance onto Maryland 26. The improvements consist of a deceleration right in turn lane, an acceleration lane, 
and a dedicated left turn lane for Route 26 eastbound traffic. So if you're heading east on Route 26, there will be a dedicated left turn lane in, okay? Additionally, um, a designated bicycle lane in accordance with SHA's plans. So State Highway Administration has approved this plan with the improvements and the single access. Parking requirements, 83 spaces are required. They have provided 95. You'll see they've added some amenities to the site between buildings B and C. There's a recreational area. There's also a walking trail. And that was a point of discussion at the concept plan review. It was at that point in time, three feet wide. There were some comments that would be nice to see it wider. So it is actually a five foot walking trail now. It winds all the way back to a gazebo over here, as well as on the east side, another gazebo over here. The proposed sign is located right here near that loop at the end of the walking trail. The sign itself you'll see um, in your plan set on sheet 16. It is five foot high, 10 foot wide, um, it's a red brick monument sign with tan vinyl letters, okay? So again, the public water and sewer are occurring through the school property. The Bureau of Utilities has approved the plan. Um, the Department of Planning commented that the developer might contact Carroll Transit to discuss options for adding a transit stop. And planning also recommended sidewalk and bicycle infrastructure, which is, of course, included in this plan. So to address stormwater management, you'll see a facility on the far east side of the property, as well as throughout the property, um, some micro facilities. One, two, three, four, five. There is a retaining wall located along the eastern side of the property. And if I flip to the next slide, maybe, yes. You'll see the landscaping included in the plan. That was another item of discussion at the concept review as um, screening landscaping. We do have landscaping at the retaining wall, along Route 26, and then at the dumpsters that are proposed on site here, okay? A photometric plan is included on sheet 26. We have 18 foot high light poles. And the retaining um, And lastly, a forest conservation is being addressed with offsite banking. That is our final slide. So pursuant to chapter 155, staff does recommend approval of the site development plan. We're also gonna be, we're asking for two approvals today, one in accordance with chapter 155 and one in accordance with chapter 156. As a residential site plan, this plan of development is subject to concurrency management. So in regards to chapter 155, staff does recommend approval in accordance with the five conditions outlined in your staff report, that one, the developer enters into a public works agreement with Carroll County. Number two, there are utility easements to be granted to the commissioners. They are here as well as here. And those will be recorded simultaneously with the PWA. That a stormwater management easement and maintenance agreement be granted to the county commissioners simultaneously with the PWA. Number four, that a landscape maintenance agreement be recorded simultaneously with the PWA. Number five, that the site plan replaces the previously approved 44 Liberty site plan, which was S07019, which becomes void. And number six, that any changes to this plan will require an amended site development plan to be approved by the Carroll County Planning and Zoning Commission. And secondly, the approval for chapter 156. So residential site plans, as I mentioned, are subject to chapter 156. With regard to the final site plan, all facilities that are tested, police, fire and emergency services, 
water and sewer services and roads are considered adequate. And a building permit, number two, condition that a building permit be issued before the site plan becomes void within 18 months of the date of written planning commission approval. So we are asking for approvals in regards to both chapter 155 and 156. Um, and that concludes my report. Did you have any questions for staff or CLSI or the developers? This is uh, Jeff. Um, so I like the changes. I, I appreciate the, um, the walking path being widened from three feet to five. I think that's definitely an improvement. One of the issues I had raised last time regarded connectivity. It doesn't it looks like maybe the idea was not to have it connected. Um, I know there's an elevation, I think there's an elevation change from this location to the adjoining set of stores. If you're looking at this, it'd be to your left. You know, if you're standing out on the street looking, it'd be to your left. Um, can you just maybe somebody address why um, there is no connectivity to those stores? Yeah, this this is Jeff Ziegler. Um, I, it's, it's been a while and I'm not sure which one of them, whether it be Nick or Lou had approached the adjoining property owners to see about the connection. Um, and, and Lou and Nick, please jump in and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the discussion was the owner would be interested in it, um, at such time that we got approval and started construction, but was not looking to make it a part of our site plan. That's correct. Yeah. Um, any idea why that would be the case? I'm just curious. I don't know. They just weren't interested in getting involved at this time. Okay. You know, it doesn't matter, obviously, but I, I still worry about safety. We have a, people living in this community and they're kind of locked in unless they're gonna drive. Um, so hopefully you can encourage them to have the connectivity you would think from just their own self-interest, they'd be interested in having a good point, good safe point of connection between them and, and the stores uh, there. But otherwise I think they're gonna have to walk out on the, on the roadway to get there. Jeff, I, I agree with what you're saying. And I, I will say that, you know, in that we are, we have all these plans about trails and connectivity and, you know, ha having, being able to connect things like this, it just makes sense that we, we do this when we have major construction projects like this. This is the, this is the right time to do it. And if we don't do it, the county will have to do it later at our expense. And so, um, I, I appreciate you raising the question because I think it's valid and I think it's an important thing to do to just bring the community together. Not only that, in that the property is adjacent to a school, it just seems to me to be even more, more reasonable to do this. So it would still need to come back as a site plan if they ultimately decide to do that later, am I correct? Or an amended site plan? So the plan right now does show sidewalk to the Western edge of the property um, and then the walking trail within. And I think that's kind of, it sounds like the best we could do right now, right? They, they're, they're developing that on their property and then the adjoining property it sounds like there was communication and that would be a, a different, um, right? It's it's not part of this site development. So that would be a different entity that you may see if they chose to do something on that property in the future, right? If they made any okay. revisions to their existing site. Okay. Yeah, and I'm not sure we can compel anything. I'm just sort of, uh, emphasizing my strong advocacy, if nothing else, for public safety, that if you uh, if you guys can continue the dialogue with them when you're actually out there doing the work, it just seems like that would be maybe the uh, most opportune time to do it. 
And as yeah, I say, right. it seems like it'd be in their self-interest to do it as well. So I just strongly encourage that. This is this is Lou Toth speaking. Um, we did, like Laura said, we ran that sidewalk all the way to the property line on the west edge. And uh, I think it's going to be a natural thing for us to talk to the people of the shopping center once that's in to, to connect to it. But at this point, they just weren't up to, you know, they didn't really want to get involved with understanding the whole issue. Um, but I think that's something that'll make sense as the site gets developed. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Totally understand. Yeah, I, I do think that's a pretty steep grade for the adjoining property owner, which may be his concern, because doing a sidewalk up through there could be costly. Um, is there is there easy access to the school? I mean, is that I don't really know how this works. I mean, I guess, you know, do you want a bunch of people wandering around the school ground? I don't know. Um, but certainly, again, in terms of opportunities for people to walk in areas that are open and safe and flat and all of that sort of thing, it seems like um, it's, it backs right up to the school grounds. Is that um, something that the accessibility to that is, is um, encouraged or discouraged or we're just at best ambivalent as a developer? Laura, I don't know if you can pull up an aerial view of it, but um, to answer that, um, the school site has a 35 foot wide forestry easement surrounding their property. Um, the only cut throughs of that 35 foot easement is where the water and sewer is being connected to the public system. Um, on the other side of that, there is the ball fields that are in uh, on the school property. So the, the tree line, Jeff, is part of that forest conservation easement on the school property, correct? Right. Yeah, it's, a, it's a recorded forest easement. Mm -hmm. But you're saying they're gonna they're gonna be cutting through that to put the uh, water and sewer in, is that right? Correct. Yeah, there's there's two 20 foot easements through there to allow for our water line and sewer lines to be connected. And th does that give us an opportunity to have sort of easy access for the residents there to be able to to head out onto the school property if they want to watch the ball practices of the ball games and things like that. Those easements will be remain open. Yes. Any other comments or questions? Well, um, this is a final site plan. We have, we need two motions. Yes. Ms. Cheatwood, I'm not sure there is anybody here from the public. I was contacted by one person asking just to see the plans, but I'm not sure that individual is here today. Um, if anybody has called in that would like to comment on this plan, please go ahead now, state your name and your address. So it appears we don't have anybody. So if we could go ahead and have any motions. Okay, so this is Jeff Walters. I'll go ahead and um, make a motion pursuant to chapter 155 uh, and move for approval of the site development plan subject to the six conditions listed in the staff report. A motion by Mr. Waters with a second by Ms. Kirchner. Approval of the site plan pursuant to Chapter 155 with the about six conditions in the staff report. Since this is the final, I'm going to go ahead and do a, a roll call vote. Mr. Canale? Yes. 
Ms. Kirkman? Yes. Mr. Wathers? Yes. Mr. Lester? Yes. Please let the record reflect that four in favor and the motion carries. This is Jeff Wathers again, and I'll make a motion pursuant to chapter 156 that the uh, final residential site plan be approved subject to the two conditions listed in the staff report. I'll second. We have a motion by Mr. Wathers and a second by Mr. Lester. Mr. Lester, you may proceed. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes. Mr. Wathers? Yes. Mr. Lester? Yes. Let the record reflect that four in favor and the motion carries. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. With that, we'll move on to item number 12, our continued discussion of the comprehensive rezoning residential. Good morning. Um, Matt, could I get the ability to share my screen? Great. Thank you. Um, can everybody see that? Um, just as a reminder, we left right here at the residential section of the use table on March 31st. Um, we've already gone through the definitions, some general regulations, temporary and seasonal uses, the purposes of all four districts, and we began the use table, which was agricultural, commercial, and recreational. So we're going to pick up here on in the residential category. I'm going to go first, and also, as always, I'm going to run through this, but we do have Jay, Brenda, Linda, and um, Laura to answer any specific questions you may have regarding some of these. Um, the first category, subcategory, is household living. And multifamily dwellings not in a planned unit development and in a planned unit development, those are the only two categories for multifamily dwellings. There is no change to that. They're currently permitted in the R10 and R7500 as long as they're in a planned unit development. And again, that's no change. The next two are a very big change and came out of discussions through the master plan and the freedom, particularly the freedom plan. So retirement homes, which we talked about the definition earlier and age restricted multifamily housing constructed on or after January 21st, 2021 is now going to be prohibited in the R40 and R20 where it is currently a conditional use. And this is in line with the discussions and the recommendations in the Freedom Plan, specifically the land use definitions. The reason you see the category below, the subcategory below, is because we wanted to recommend grandfathering the existing age-restricted multifamily housing that has come through the county to this point. And this would make them not become non-conforming uses. Um, the only comment we've received on this specifically is the, and you received it either yesterday or this morning, the Carroll County Realtors are opposing this change. Um, they have a, about a two page letter that you should have received. I don't wanna paraphrase what they said, but basically the shortage of, and the lack of diversity of housing, they feel this is an important thing to keep in the code is to allow this in some form, conditional use. Um, the next category is single family dwelling. This is permitted in all four residential districts. Again, when we get to the bulk requirements, we'll talk about the size of the lots and things like that, but just as a use, it is permitted in all four districts. Um, Can I ask a quick question about the, the two, by adding the second. So for the, the retirement age restricted that are already present, they become conditional. So they're not non-conforming, but they don't have to do anything else. Like they don't have to go forward with the BZA or anything. They just, it just, it just rolls seamlessly. Okay. Correct. Yes. And we did that a few times with the commercial and industrial when we identified a number of uses. We're not 
as we've talked about, we're not looking to make people non-conforming uses. And sometimes there's options to rezone later, but in this case, that wouldn't be an option. You wouldn't want to be rezoning them to a higher density um, category. So this seemed to be the best alternative for those developments, those existing developments. So regarding yeah, townhouses. Jeff, Jeff Weathers, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but back no, to the same thing, this retirement home. So we're saying that they're prohibited um, in R40,000 and R20,000, where are, and you said this and I, I just missed it, where are they permitted? They are permitted um, like the one you just saw in the commercial districts. Okay, okay. But so, not, they will no longer be permitted in, other than by conditional use in the R10 and R75. But as you know, we really don't have at this point R10 and R7500 to develop right now. So. Um, you, you will be seeing them probably come in as you did today in the commercial districts. And so to the point raised in the letter by the Realtors Association, the diversity of housing is still permitted in other zoning districts, just not these two. Yes, that's correct. We are not getting rid of the idea of age-restricted multifamily housing. Again, you could, if we have the land for it, it could be in the R10 and R75, and it also can be in the three commercial districts, I believe. Okay. I'm sorry, Thank two you. commercial districts, C1 and C2, not C3. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, the next category are townhouses, and this is confusing as the Realtors Association let us know in their letter, and I, we can fix this so it isn't so confusing. So a townhouse that is not in a planned unit development or retirement village is not permitted anywhere. A townhouse that is in a planned unit development is currently permitted in the R10 and R75. We're making no change to that. And if it's in a retirement village, it would be permitted. Um, we, we have received several comments on this and I'll go through them, but specifically regarding the realtors comment, they are requesting that retirement village be actually listed as a separate use. And I agree with them that we can come back to you with, um, a new way to format this, that that will be clearer. I think they're correct in that, especially if they identified it. Our whole goal here was to make things more understandable and user-friendly. So if they're having trouble understanding it, that's not what we wanna do. So I can come back. Um, we just received that comment last night or this morning. So we can, we can fix that, but it won't change what we're talking about here as far as if it's a townhouse and it's in a retirement village, it would be a permitted use. Um, I will point out, and we've gotten comments on this from several groups, it's a newly defined use, but attached senior housing is currently allowed in all the residential districts with a maximum density of up to six units per acre. So this is actually a reduction in density, and we'll get to that when we do bulk requirements of um, down to 3.5. So this is also consistent with the adopted plans and specifically for the residential medium which is of great concern, and that is the R20. Um, the specific statement is 55 plus, plus age-restricted housing is permitted provided they do not exceed a total of 3.5 dwelling units per acre. That's right in both plans. That's why we felt this, as we recommended this, that this was consistent with the plans. Um, and it is a reduction in density in what's currently permitted. Um, the comments we've received, specifically the FDCA, the Freedom District Citizens Association, did not really address the density, but they did, you have their letter, talk about how townhouses and two-family dwellings should not be allowed in the R20,000. So you could still, if, if you were going to go with that recommendation, you could still have a retirement village on yes. smaller yes. single-family lots with the ability to achieve the 3.5. However, um, our recommendation is for the townhouses and two family dwellings to be allowed. You also received a letter from John McGuire and his comments really, I think we're gonna address it at the next meeting because they are regarding allowing the density to be higher and also regarding bulk requirements. Um, I believe he wants them to be less flexible and to be set in the code. Again, we'll be getting to bulk requirements. So I would recommend we delay that decision and again, the realtors are requesting that we make this whole issue a little bit clearer in the use table. Um, and basically the same thing is then repeated for two family dwellings that we just talked about for townhouses. 
Are there any questions on the household living that we just went through? Um, I think as far as making any changes and having a complete discussion, we will have to wait until you go through the bulk requirements, which include the density um, and the lot sizes, because I think that's, they're all wrapped up together. And that is the disadvantage of going page by page through this, but we can certainly, when we get to those, then come back to the use table if you wanna make any changes. Okay, the next subcategory is group living. There've been no changes made here. Assisted living, if it's eight or fewer residents is permitted. If it's more than eight, it's a conditional use in all districts. And that is also true with nursing home and continuing care retirement community. There were no recommendations in the freedom or master plan regarding this, and we are making no recommended changes. Okay, the next subcategory is institutional and community service. Um, really, the biggest change here is private schools. We, are, we were recommending that they went from a permitted use to a conditional use in all four districts. And really, our rationale as staff was that they were similar to some of these other um, daycare, nursery school, community center. Um, but it has been brought to our attention, and you do have two letters that you've received, one from the attorney for Gerstel, and also Jack Lyburn has sent you a request that this remain a permitted use. And as far as consistency goes, I would point out public schools are a permitted use. So if you're looking for, we were looking at consistency with some of the similar uses, but the other consistency issue would be public schools, which are a permitted use. Um, we have identified four schools that would be impacted and would become non-conforming uses. And again, one of them is Gerstel, which is on almost 92 acres. Um, so I know Dave Bowersox is here today and he was going to speak at the end. I don't know if you wanna wait and um, Ms. Cheatwood and hold all the comments until the end. Oh, I think so, yes, please. Okay. Um, so that really is the only issue I wanted to bring forward under the institutional and community service. And staff really has no problem with looking at that again as staying a, a principal permitted use. So just so I understand, any public school is permitted in all districts, right? Okay. Correct. Do we have a definition of private school or any um, I do not believe we do, but Jay, do you know off, off the top of your head if we do? Uh, yeah, private schools are usually regulated by the state of Maryland and um, their definition of a private school is what we would go by. So there, there, there's some kind of definition of what is a private school. Okay. Um, seem to be missing a page. Okay, well, we're missing on here, but I can, I can just talk about it, and you do have it in your packet. The very beginning of the next section, which is 158.075.2, which is the regulation of accessory uses. And um, just as a reminder, um, and for anyone else that's list, listening, what an accessory use is, it is a use of land or all or part of a building which is customarily incidental and secondary to the principal use of the property and which is located on the same lot with the principal use. And um, just as a reminder, when we did the commercial and industrial, we really looked at this definition to make sure, we looked at other codes, we looked at any problems we saw with it. And um, I don't believe we made any changes at that time and we're not recommending any changes to it this time. It's a pretty standard definition of accessory uses. And something to remember, and it's why, you know, people have asked us a few times, why didn't we do a use table just for the accessory use? Because we really just pull out certain accessory uses where there's going to be further explanation or further requirement. Um, but in general, if it's a use of land, which is customarily incidental and secondary to the principal use as determined by the zoning administrator, then it would be considered an accessory use. So we couldn't possibly list all the accessory uses but when some are of particular interest, 
they're pulled out and extra um, attention is given to them in this section. So this whole section was relocated from individual districts. Um, a lot of the deleted language you saw was as we went through um, each district, these were listed separately and usually repetitively. So this puts them all in one place. Um, there wasn't any reason to keep them separate. They really applied in all four districts, pretty much the same. Um, another major change, and we will get to this uh, at a later section as well, certain uses where the requirement for a public hearing has been eliminated or replaced by a signed affidavit. And as we go through, you'll see which ones those are. Um, so the first one, and we're gonna get to where I actually, the missing page ends. The first one is um, antique shop, arts and craft shop when operated by a resident and subject to 158.130G. Um, we did receive one comment on that from the Freedom Dis District Citizens Association. Um, they are objecting. Okay. Um, there's no change in this actual use, but there is a change in the approval process to eliminate the requirement for a public hearing, replacing it with a posting of the property and notice to adjoining property owners who may then request a public hearing. If no request is received, the zoning administrator may issue a decision. Um, the FDCA has objected to this, and you've got that. I'm not going to paraphrase what they said, but you've got that in your packet. This is another one um, I would probably suggest. We're going to go through that section in detail at the May meeting, and there's several um, other uses where this change applies, so it may be a good idea to go through that at that time and then circle back to the uses. If you... If you're agreeing with that change, we'll identify specifically what uses are being um, impacted. And I'm gonna ask Jay, was there anything else, Jay, that you wanted to bring up about um, that potential change at this point, or do you wanna wait until we, we go into it in detail? Um, I'll rather wait until we go into detail. Okay, yeah, and that is towards the end of the, the legislation, so that will, probably be at your May 20th meeting, if that's, I'm sorry, your May 18th meeting. Okay, um, the next that you still don't see on the page is attached accessory dwelling units, which are subject to the following. And I'm gonna read these because there is a lot of interest in this in the um, topic of accessory dwelling units. So this is only attached dwelling units. Um, an attached accessory dwelling must have direct access from the outside only one attached accessory dwelling is permitted on any principal dwelling unit. The property owner must occupy either the principal dwelling unit or the attached accessory dwelling unit. And then we're getting to this. That's now where this new language comes in. I'm sorry, it is not new language. There are no changes from the current code. So what I just read you is in the current code as well as D through H. Um, so there haven't really been too many comments regarding attached dwelling units. You did get one. The um, realtors, the Carroll County realtors did make a comment regarding, I don't believe they made a comment regarding attached. I apologize. But when we get to the detached, you'll see there's a number of comments. Um, again, beauty and barbershop, there's been no changes to that other than the way it would be reviewed that we're going to talk about later. No changes to cemetery. Um, so cottage industry is def defined as manufacturing or assembly conducted by a member or members of a family residing on the property with no more than two non-resident employees. And this is a current definition. So again, the change from the current code here is a change in the approval process that we'll get to at a later meeting. And also the elimination of the requirement that the accessory use may not generate traffic, parking, sewerage, or water use to a greater extent than would normally result from residential occupancy. And the reason staff is recommending that come out and Jay may want to elaborate on it is because it's really 
difficult to interpret and enforce because what would normally result from residential occupancy is dependent on a lot of different um, factors. So it, it's not something that was, it was something that was very subjective and it was recommended that it's just not something that we can um, interpret very well. Jay, did you want to elaborate on that? Uh, yes. Um, the one thing about that, with taking that out, just by the very presence of a cottage industry, you're going to increase something out of that list, which could eliminate it from being a residential use. Um, you know, if you're going to have some type of business cottage industry there, yes, there is going to be a little more traffic coming to that property because there's a house plus a, a business owner. So by eliminating all that, it takes that, that section out. So it's not really contradicting itself in that, yeah, you can have the cottage industry, but you can't increase anything beyond the normal residential use, which in, is, in of itself is very hard to define. Thank you. Um, I also want to point out the FDCA objected to the elimination of that language that we just discussed. So what would what would be the process? I mean, um, I mean, I can understand why the objection to that process. Um, you know, if you're living next to somebody who, who has a cottage industry go out of their house and I know these are subjective de definitions of nuisance, traffic, and such. How, how do we then address that? Well, what's left in there are what we feel are less subjective, like um, A, it can't include inventory or merchandise sold directly to the public. It can't change the exterior appearance of the building. There can't be outside storage. Those are things that the zoning administrator can enforce. You're right, hazard is a little tricky too. Um, result in electrical interference and that's currently these are all currently in the code but um that particular mayor, language about comparing it to the residential occupancy was just difficult i believe mary can i say something sure please uh, also the letter f is becoming a nuisance uh that's something that you know if it's becoming a nuisance, and a nuisance is, is very subject. I mean, it's it's a very broad definition. What's a nuisance, um, and how has it become a nuisance? But that's something that would be a call that my office would make. Um, and if it comes a nuisance to the neighbor, either too much noise, or yes, there is too much traffic, or something other than that that is affecting the neighborhood and is becoming a problem, then we can revoke that approval because it's becoming a nuisance. And, and like I say, that's, it's a very individual thing. It's, it's, it's hard to define what a nuisance is, uh, but that's generally a, uh, a call that I make uh, as the zoning administrator. And like I say, that's a reason that we can revoke any kind of approval for a cottage industry. Mary, you may have, this is Jeff, you may have said this, and I apologize as I'm listening. For me, I, I hear it, and then I go back and revisit it, and so I probably missed. But what's a what's a really mainstream example of cottage industry uh, that you were talking about? I'm going to turn that one over to Jay. In this county, I'm not sure what, what he sees very often for cottage industry. A cottage industry can be just about almost anything, any type of manufacturing or um, uh, process that, that fits that definition. Um, we've had somebody who's just applied, actually believe it or not, for to do a popcorn manufacturing business out of their home where they're making individual um, runs of popcorn, different flavors and stuff, but they're doing it all at their home, but they're manufacturing some, they're manufacturing a product. Um, so it could be that, um, it could be a, a gunsmith possibly, you know, who's, you know, manufacturing parts for, for weapons or, or firearms or some types or, or repairing them. Uh, it could be, um, like, like the list is vast. I mean, it's really not a list. It's just almost anything can become a cottage industry as long as it, meets all those definitions of 
no more than two employees, no public and anything. So if, if you're making something, if you're, um, I'm going to say, let's say you're a welder and you make garden um, decorations or something in your garage, that can be a cottage industry. So you're, you're making them, you're creating them there, you're manufacturing them, but you're selling them someplace else. So like I okay. said, it could be almost anything as a cottage industry. That's why it's not specifically listed what they are. But just can't, I mean, one of the things, letter A says the inventory can't be sold directly to the public on the premises. So they're, they're sold to the That's public correct. somewhere else, right? Correct. And like I say, I mean, if you're, if you're manufacturing something, yes, you're going to have um, an inventory of stuff, but you can't sell, the public can't come to your house and buy it. You have to take it off the property, flea markets, you know, yard sales, or to a business someplace else and sell it through them. It can't be done at the premise that way no public is there to buy anything and you're not operating a retail store on the property you're just doing the manufacturing what about they're selling it online i mean are they selling it directly to the public well, on the premise? mail order um and internet sales are allowed it's a it's a different accessory use um it is it is allowed at, at, under a home occupation so like i say you could do that also it's in that case, it's not you're not manufacturing anything. You're just, you know, selling it. Cat, you know, it, it's more you're just selling stuff online than than anything. Okay. Well, I don't need to get into a deep discussion. I know I'm taking up a lot of time, but if I'm a welder and I make lawn ornaments and then I sell them online to the public, you know, am I selling this directly to the public on the premises? Even though the public doesn't have to come here, but I certainly am selling them. Well, you are selling them, but then again, like I say, we do have a process for mail mail, in, mail order or internet-based sales. So there is another process. You could also get approval to do that through that process. Thank you. But it's important to remember, too, that these are the accessory uses and not principal uses. So there really shouldn't be, if there is any concern that this is a commercial business operating in a residential neighborhood, it is first and foremost a, a residence and then this is considered an accessory use to that and, and that, like, that's correct and like i said these all have to be done basically by the resident uh, except under a cottage industry where it does allow you to have two employees but if you're doing um mail order or internet-based sales that has to be done by residents of the property you can't have employees coming in and doing that and i guess i would just simply ask to please help me understand the cottage industry we're basically talking about something that is is manufactured we're not talking about services we're not talking about someone who's an appraiser someone who's you know uh now working remotely from their home and providing a service to their their employer uh this is primarily like a hobby that you've turned into a money maker is that you know you're you're, you're making jams or something like that is that right yes that's correct uh, like I say, some of those other things, uh, like say services, if, if you're a plumber and you run your business from your house or something like that, yeah, you can get a home occupation to run the business. If you know you're an individual plumber and you don't have any employees coming to the house and it's just you, yeah, you know, there are provisions that you can do that in other ways. Um, but this, you have to be making something. Um, it it can't be you're just you know repackaging it or anything you have to change it it has to be a different product coming out of the business than it is coming in um that that's the big thing okay um i'm going to move on to the detached accessory dwelling units which are a um allowed accessory use and the language in there which is current language this is all current in the code is very important to the understanding of this issue because there's been a lot of discussion about this. So detached accessory dwelling units, and again, this is in all of the residential districts as well as the ag, but right now we're just talking about residential. The language that follows it, provided that the lot or parcel is eligible to be subdivided to separate the detached accessory dwelling and subject to the following. Um, what that means is it already has to have the potential for two homes. It has the same restrictions as attached accessory dwellings with the exception of the size um, not being limited to 800 square feet and the bedroom restrictions. 
So again, um, only one per lot or parcel eligible to be subdivided. The property owner must occupy either the principal dwelling or the detached dwelling on the lot or parcel. It must meet all applicable building construction and health codes. Two off-street parking spaces must be provided for the detached dwelling unit. Oh, no. Um, okay. Um, I'm just going to have to work off of the, Linda, unless you want to try to pull up the other code, but I think I'm, I don't know where all that language went. I will just have to read it to you and you'll have it in front of you. I apologize. Um, two yeah, off street parking lot. Would you like me to pull up the um, information? Yeah, but it's not on, I don't know why this April 20th PDF doesn't seem to have everything. Can you pull up, Linda, what's online, that that code? I also have what you sent out yesterday. So you want what's on the website? Yeah, what I sent out yesterday is what I'm doing now. And it, hold on. I apologize. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so what I Linda, if you could pull that up, that'd be helpful. And then if you could have Linda share her screen. And Linda, if you could go to page 29. Okay, so I'm looking, um, which, what am the I residential, reading? The most recent residential text. For 155 or 158. Okay, it's all the way down, it's all the way near the end at 29. Can you see that? Yes. So could you go back up to number six, detached? That's perfect. Thank you. Can you go back up to detached accessory dwelling units? Thanks. Okay. Um, and that's where I left off. You have to have two off-street parking spaces provided for the detached accessory dwelling unit. Detached accessory dwelling units shall not be subject to any size limits as the attached are. Um, we've received a number of comments in both directions regarding this, and it is no change from the current code. Um, however, the FDCA has objected to the continued inclusion of these units in the code. Um, there is a concern that it allows more density. Um, your letter yesterday from the realtors uh, opposes the requirement that it has to be subdividable and is requesting that in line with some of the national trends and the recommendations of the Freedom Plan, that you take out that requirement so you could actually have on a single lot um, a detached accessory dwelling, even if it's not subject to being allowed to be subdivided. So those are the two, those are pretty polar opposite recommendations regarding that. Um, anything else? Does anybody have any questions about that? Currently allowed. So the text you have is exactly what is currently allowed. Yes, it's just been relocated from all those individual sections. And we did as a group, we discussed, because of the national trends, there is a, a lot of talk about, you know, sometimes called granny flats over garages, things like that, that there's very few properties that are gonna be able to do it because if they had the ability to subdivide, they'd probably be subdivided. Um, right. So on a typical lot, but then on the flip side of it, you, there's a concern by the citizens have expressed a concern in the freedom area that this could basically just add extra density. It's a way to get around the density restrictions of the district, which currently as written, it is not. You could not get around with this. I mean, if I can add, I will say my understanding from other codes and um, you know conferences and literature is that Carroll County um, has a progressive accessory dwelling unit um, ordinance within the code and you know this would just even make it more progressive which is a, a good thing for in terms of just being able to have that variety of housing and meeting the goals and objectives 
of the freedom plan as it's written. So again, we've always been a little more on the cutting edge of this. So what we don't have in the variety of different types of zoning and density, one thing that does help with that is this accessory dwelling unit. All right, but currently you have to be able to subdivide the property. For the detached, correct. Detached, but like we said with, with trends, I mean, there's a, like a lot of in-law kind of uh, families living on one with a small, okay. Which you can do if it's attached. It's different to, you don't have to have that ability to subdivide for the attached unit, just for the detached. Right, but then also if we were to take out that, you, you know, say we take out you, the land has to be subdividable. We go, I uh, wouldn't be comfort, comfortable with subject to any, not subject to any size limit. So that that's a little worrisome to, if, if we do change it and allow it on property that's not subdividable, then the size limits would have to be, I think a definite must. Well, one thing you have to remember, if you take out the requirement for the lot not to be subdivided. Basically what you're doing is you're doubling the density of every lot in the county. And that's what we're trying to avoid is doubling that density. Cause basically you're saying if you can have, you know, one house on an R20 lot, now you can have two houses. Now they'd have to be sold as two houses on the same property. And that causes problems in of itself down the future. How many people want to buy two houses on one property? But like you say, you instantly increase the density in every lot in the county by allowing them to put a second dwelling there. All right, thanks, Jay. So if I have a large detached garage and I want to turn it, half of it into an apartment, is that what this is, a detached okay. That would be a detached accessory dwelling, yes, because it's separate from the home. It's not attached to it. Now, if it's a, a garage attached to a house and you're putting a but yes, you could do it as an attached accessory dwelling. But if it's a detached garage and it's 10 feet from the existing house but not attached, no, you couldn't do it because you couldn't subdivide the property. Thanks. Are there any more questions on that topic? Okay. Um, the next number seven, family daycare. The change here is what we talked about earlier that we're going to go back to replacing the requirement for a public hearing with the signed affidavit. And I'm just gonna let Jay weigh in on that because Jay felt strongly, I believe that when he reviews family daycare He's really just looking at state requirements and a signed affidavit would suffice. So Jay, do you want to elaborate on that? Uh, yeah, basically according to state law, a family daycare is allowed in, in any house or any home in the county um, automatically. I mean, they, they approve from a state level as long as it's less than eight children. And that does include any children that are already at that house. Yeah, it's, it's allowed anywhere. And, and basically all we're looking for when we go out to approve it and have the public hearing is, are there any zoning violations on the property? Is it a, a, a safe access to the property from um, a highway or a county road? Um, that's, that's all we're really looking at because I'm not going into somebody's house to, to review the inside of their house for it. I'm just looking from, at it from an outside perspective. And with having the signed affidavit and everything, we can still do that, but it just eliminates the, the month and a half, almost two months sometimes requirement before you can have a public hearing and, and getting the approval and everything. It just makes it a much more efficient and a, a faster way of getting approval for something that I can't think of any place in the 12 years I've been administered that I've actually turned down a family daycare unless it's been a safety issue of pulling into and out of the property. And most of the times the people have corrected that and then we've allowed it. So it, it's, it's really making things easier on a lot of families who want to have a daycare. It makes this, the approval faster. Okay. 
Okay, um, the next accessory use is fowl as an accessory use to any dwelling. This is the backyard chicken issue that we discussed a little bit. And um, I'm gonna turn this over to Brenda who developed this criteria. Um, Brenda. <laughs> Essentially, you know, we, we've already been allowing um, chickens in the backyard. We changed it to fowl because there are some other things that um, may fall under the category, you know, like peace or whatever. Um, we specifically used fowl and not poultry because things like ostriches and emus are considered um, poultry but not fowl. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll let Jay talk about um, why we came up with the acreage that we did, but I mean, essentially a lot of this is um, 75 feet from the property line, I think is, correct me if I'm wrong, Jay, that's already um, the current requirement. And um, uh, Jay, Jay, do you have any comments on why we have yeah. um, to as, as the, the, We do currently, like say, allow chickens on properties. Uh, there's nowhere in the code that specifically says right now that you're allowed to have uh, chickens on properties less than three acres. Uh, our code says if you're going to have agricultural or agricultural activities, you have to have at least three acres. Well, if you have chickens on your property, that's an agricultural activity. What we've done is a couple years ago, um, I made a conscious decision to allow people to have a limited number of chickens on the property under three acres because this county is a very rural county. It's um, a lot of people are involved in like FFA and, and other projects. And it, it's a, believe it or not, a very large thing that's happening in the communities that people want to have chickens nowadays. Uh, so we allowed them to have it on a certain amount. And we came up with Basically, for every acre you have, you could have six chickens. Um, so if you have under an acre, you could have six chickens. If you have two acres, you could have 12. If you have three acres, you could have 18. Now, one thing we have done in the past is we've said no roosters. You can have hens, but no roosters, because roosters very fast become a very big nuisance in the adjoining property owners because of their crowing every morning and all the time. So we basically said under that three acres, no roosters. Uh, that takes care of that noise part of it. But like I say, this has come about over the years by allowing people to do something um, that, you know, being an agricultural county is something agricultural that you could do at your house. Um, and these are the numbers we came up with. Um, I think personally that they're very reasonable numbers to have. Um, and by putting it in the code, it's not just an interpretation that I am making. It's actually something that I could enforce. It's written. It, this is what it has to be. Um, it makes things a lot easier to enforce when we can say, yes, this is what the code says. Instead of, no, this is just what Jay is allowing. No, this is what the code says. And that's why we want to put this requirement into the code. You know, Jay, I would not have known about this, but for your uh, description today. So uh, I very much defer to you. You're seeing these things throughout our community day in and day out. So uh, I, I, I defer like, to you. Like I said, this, this has become a very big activity for a lot of families in the county. Uh, they want their kids to learn about, you know, agricultural or, or ha learn responsibilities. Um, and this is one way they do it. And in, in addition, they're getting something out of it. They're, they're, you know, they're having hens, they can have eggs. Um, so it's, it's, like I say, it's kind of combines a whole lot of things um, that, you know, our, our community is based on. And, and it gives people the opportunity to, to learn about what goes into uh, agriculture. Yeah, sounds good. I, and I wasn't mocking you, by the way. I mean, I, I agree with you. I, mean, I just didn't know this was going on, particularly during COVID. It probably has, uh, there's probably even been more of it. So, uh, yes, it I, and like I say, it's, whatever. It's, it's a large problem we face in the county. I mean, a lot of people just went ahead and did it themselves. And, and then, you know, they have problems with roosters and stuff like that. 
Um, this just gives us the ability to say, this is what the code says you can have and, and gives us something based in law that's solid that we can say, yes, you can have this, no, you can't have that. And there are some times when you have to say no to, to having stuff and it's, this gives us that foundation to do so. I guess my, my comment on this is, yeah, again, this is something that uh, I know some of my neighbors are doing. And um, I, I just want to ask, you know, if we do 75 feet, and, and again, I think, I think what you've done is totally reasonable. I'm just kind of trying to think through, if you're 75 feet from every single property line, um, we're basically saying that you have to have 22,000 square feet to have a chicken, uh, 22,000 square feet of land. Is that right? Well, basically what we're saying, yes, you have to, if, if you can be 75 feet from the property line, and that's actually based on another section of our code that allows for um, farm animals such as horses, cattle, sheep, goats, and everything else, any building that you have them in has to be 75 feet from the property line. So this is just an extension of that requirement that if you're having farm animals, you have to be 75 feet from your neighbors. However, if your lot is so small that you can't meet that 75 feet, we do say, okay, we understand that you have to be as far as away from the neighbors as possible. So if you have neighbors on each side of it, you put it all the way in the back of your property or as far as away as you can possibly get. If you're surrounded, you put it in the middle of your lot. So it's as far away from your neighbors and not causing problems for your neighbor. But like I say, the 75 feet is definitely based on something else in the code that deals with animals. Okay, um, if there's no more questions, and just as a reminder, we did define fowl about four meetings ago, so there wouldn't be any confusion about what would fall into this category. It's usually just chickens, but as Brenda said, things change, so um, it is defined. Um, can we move on to home occupations? So a home occupation, and we discussed this a little bit in the context of cottage industry, but it's defined as a use of a dwelling con conducted solely by a resident or use of an accessory building, which is incidental or subordinate to the main use of the principal building for dwelling purposes. So this is what um, Mr. Lester, you had mentioned, I believe an accountant or some other um, business or service such as that. Um, the only change here, all the requirements remain the same, but the replacement of a, a public hearing with a signed affidavit is being proposed here. Uh, one thing of, uh, about the home occupation and, and with the requirement being changed for a public hearing, um, approximately 10 years ago, that's all you had to do was sign an affidavit. This is kind of going back to that and making it an easier process for those people who want to do something from their home. Okay. Um, Jerry, or Jay, does this one also have the opportunity for the neighbors if they want to request that there be a hearing or? Yes. Um, and when we get back into a little farther into the code, we were going to explain exactly what that is. I mean, I can do it real briefly now if you want. Um, it's up to you. I just want to know if that's well, an option. I, I can uh, briefly. So basically what we're proposing is that if you want to do a home occupation or anything else that required used to require a public hearing, you make the application to us for that use. We'll notify the neighbors the way we do now, all the adjoining property owners, and say, hey, this person wants to do this. If we don't hear from any of those neighbors saying that they want a public hearing on it, then two weeks after I send those letters out, I can go ahead and just make a decision whether to allow it or not. Now that decision is still appealable to a board of zoning appeals. But like I say, if nobody contacts us about, hey, I wanna have a public hearing on this, we don't have it. It's just a matter of me making a decision and, and going from there. If they do wanna have a public hearing on it, what we would do is we, we notify the neighbors that yes, there's going to be a public hearing on it. We'll post the property and we'll go through the same process as we currently do for that public hearing and then a decision will be made after that public hearing. 
So there's still the opportunity for people to express their opinions and comments if they want, but they need to notify us if they want to do that and have that public hearing. Otherwise, it's once again, this is a, a process that's going to save time and effort on a lot of people and having to wait a long period to go through that public hearing process when none of their neighbors may care. So they may not say anything, so we can approve it. Um, it's just something to make it a little easier on both my staff and, and the public in, in approving these. Yeah, I have to say I like the process, and it is one more reason to maintain good relationships with your neighbors. Uh, yes. I wish everybody had good relationship with the neighbors, but they don't, believe me. They don't. <laughs> okay. Um, if there's no more questions on number nine, there's no changes to number 10 that's currently in the code. Linda, do you mind scrolling down? Thanks. Um, oh, sorry. Could you scroll back up? Yes, okay, so number 11, lawn care and maintenance service. This is another one that the process is um, proposed to be changed in the way that Jay just discussed that we'll discuss in more detail. And this is lawn care and maintenance service by a resident, which is currently defined in the code. Okay, number 12 is private stable and this is defined as any building structure or land use for the shelter, feeding, or care of horses or other livestock, which is also defined livestock, for the exclusive use of the property owner or lessee. Um, I'm going to turn this one over to Brenda and Jay as well. They developed these criteria here on the next page. Yes. Take it away, Jay. Oh, thanks, Brenda. I appreciate that. Um, currently, basically, as, as the code is currently written, you're allowed between three and five acres to have up to five horses or cattle or other farm animals on your property with a stable that is 75 feet from the property lines. With this, a lot of times we get a lot of requests for people who might have two and a half acres or so or maybe just a little under three acres that they want to have a horse or two. Um, this is one way of uh, eliminating that process of necessarily needing to go through a, a, a variance hearing for that. Um, it's still very restrictive on the number of animals you can have. Like I say, if you have um, between two and four acres, you could have two animal units on there. Um, between four and six acres, you could have up to the current five animals. Uh, once you get over six acres, you're not subject to the number of animals. Well, there's no limit on the number of animals. The only thing you would have to meet at that time is that any barn or anything that those animals are kept in would have to meet the current standards of 200 feet from a neighbor. Um, so this is just a way of kind of reorganizing the private stable that we already have. It makes it more restrictive in a way that if I have 3.001 acres, According to the current code, I could have five horses on that with a stable, where now you'll, you'll need to have at least four acres to have up to those five horses. So it, it's more restrictive in that it's fewer animals on the lower amount of acres that you have than what is currently allowed. And as a reminder, animal units are defined. Um, we went over it several meetings ago. They're on the first page of the text amendment where it breaks down what constitutes each animal unit um, based on size, primarily size, Brenda. Are there any questions on private stables? And again, this doesn't affect the ag, this only affects the residential districts at this point. Okay, um, number 13, there's... So you said it doesn't affect ag, but will we carry this forward when we do the ag? Because quite a bit of our ag land is used as residential. 
that's our intention to look at it again. The definition will already be in the code for animal units, so we will just look at it. If it if it's deemed appropriate for ag, we may not we may not need to um, as an accessory use to ag because it might be the principal use on ag. We'll have to. We haven't really talked about that a whole lot, but we will do whatever it takes to make it consistent to make it work. Now, the the five animal units for the four to six. Jay, how did, is that just kind of to compromise what's currently in in the code, or did you look at other places to see? Because you know, out where I am, you know, most people have the four to six acres, and even five horses is quite a bit for that. Personally, I think yes, five five or, or animal units on you know four acres or four and a half acres is a lot on. Is a really hard on the, the property to maintain those animals. But this is something that's been in the code from the very beginning of the county code. Uh, something along this line has, has been around for a long, long time. Um, excuse me, I gotta. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, so, like I say, it, it's another way of restricting on the lower amount of acres the number of animals you can have than what is current because like i say right now in three acres you can have five horses whereas under what we're proposing you can only have the most two horses on up to four acres so we're trying to look at that and make it easier on the land to support the number of animals on there um, than what we currently have but like i say it's it really it's just reconfiguring what we have to make it, I think, more humane on the animals to have more room per animal. Yeah, I agree. I mean, that's much better than what we have now. Um, but I, I still think five on four to six acres is still quite a bit and never ends up. Well, is that one of the reasons we kept the, the number of five? Because we have a lot of people out there who already have private stables. Uh, and like I say, we don't want to make something non-conforming if we don't have to. And by allowing that five horses, all those private stables that are out there are already between three and five acres with five horses on them, basically will not become non-conforming. Thank you. Okay, um, we're almost wrapping this up. Number 13 is professional office of a single physician, insurance agent, realtor, or other profession similar in use and characteristics. Um, again, subject to 158.130G, it is um, the process that Jay explained. We are eliminating from the current code the requirement that it be located in the dwelling. And I believe, Jay, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's because some of these are actually in a separate accessory dwelling, like a garage, what's typically considered a garage. That's, that's correct. And like I say, the one thing that, that differentiates a professional office of a physician from uh, a home occupation is that in this case, you're going to allow your customers to come to the building. Um, if you're an insurance agent or a realtor or something, yes, you can have customers come to your residence under this as a professional office. Whereas in a home occupation, it wouldn't be allowed to have customers coming. And like I say, it's it's basically the, the same now, just that we're eliminating the re requirement for the requirement for a public hearing. It's going to be basically an option in the future, hopefully, um, if the neighbors want the public hearing. Okay, um, the next two are currently in the code. The final one that just says all other uses and structures customarily incidental, accessory and incidental to any principal permitted use or authorized conditional use. That is a catch all for anything that would be deemed to be um, an accessory use that isn't specified here. Um, that does conclude our recommendations for principal uses in the use table as well as this list of accessory uses. Um, unless there's any specific questions, we had talked at the next meeting, I believe it's May 5th, 
of moving into the bulk requirements, as well as a discussion of the changes to cluster subdivisions, which we have received a number of comments on. Um, and then we are, um, I believe, going to wrap up with some more zoning administration and enforcement issues and circle back to the questions that you had earlier, where staff is gonna come back with a few um, proposed changes. So. Are there any questions? Mary Jean Canelli, yes, I have a question. I don't want to open Pandora's box, but uh, I envision, you know, first of all, a great presentation. I've, I've really learned a lot out of this compared to where we were. I think you, you and your staff did a great job. But I see the potential of a conflict between a homeowners association's covenants and the county code. If that I'm going to let yeah. Jay take that because that is true. Yes. But Jay, yes. Uh, if, example, I, if I wanted to have three horses on my four acre property and my neighbor or, or the covenants within the community, within the, the association do not permit three horses per acre. But who has the final ruling on that and how does it get enforced? Uh, there, there are two separate ways, um, two separate things, uh, covenants and, and zoning enforcement. What the county enforces in zoning, the laws of the, in zoning, are what the county and I can enforce on, on property owners. If they have covenants that restrict things on their property, the only way they can be enforced, and this is in reality the only way they can be enforced, is if the homeowners association takes that property owner to court to enforce those requirements. The county will not get involved in that discussion whatsoever. That's between the property owners of that subdivision that all agree to that agreement. It's up to the homeowners association or it could be an individual neighbor in that um, community. It's up to them to enforce those covenants. We get that question a lot and it comes up at a lot of hearings that I have that, well, our covenants say you can't have a business on your property. Well, that's your covenants and that's something that you as a homeowners association or individual in that neighborhood are gonna have to enforce. The county says under county law that yes, you can have the business there. And as far as we're concerned, it's proper to have there and it's approvable. So there are two separate things the county doesn't get involved in any covenant discussions with property owners. Um, we don't set covenants when we do developments or anything. That's something that's usually created by the developer. So that's all totally a civil matter between the property owners. And we as a county get no way involved in that. Thank you, Jay. Made that very mm -hmm. clear. Ms. Chiwood, I think you do have people that wanted to comment. I don't know if that would be at the at the end of the meeting, which I think we're at anyways. Yeah, I, I, I've been trying to do with the Do you have names of people who have signed up or are you, are you just going to call? I've been doing the sign up for these general public comments, so I do not. Um, but uh, there are callers on the line and um, one caller I can see is actually Wayne Schuster. So just because I can see him, I'll call him first, but we also have uh, four others on the line after him as well. And you wanna go ahead and let them speak? Yeah, so before we do that really quickly, Mary, so for the next meeting, we already said May 5th, we're gonna pick up with um, 158.075, which is the bulk requirement. And then, um, continue on at the May 5th meeting to try to complete this section of the code, correct? Um, no, we were gonna do what you just said was the bulk requirements, but then we were gonna jump to the changes in 155 that oh, are regarding right. cluster, because gotcha. that is going to be a lengthy discussion, I think. And we've told people that we will try to have it on an evening meeting on May 5th. So I okay. believe we will do that and then go back to the few remaining issues still in 158 at the next meeting. All right, great, thank you. I know you just said that, but thank you for clarifying. Okay, well then I'm gonna go ahead and uh, call the callers now. Uh, Wayne Schuster, uh, caller number one. And if we can, control room, get a timer, please, that would be helpful. Thank you. 
Sure. Um, this is Wayne Schuster, um, Eldersburg resident. I'm representing the FDCA uh, this morning. Um, thank you for the discussion. Uh, we have a lot of comments and letters uh, and emails and everything that we think have been shared with you all. Um, you know, we're still focused on the uh, townhome uh, allowances in the R20,000 uh, district. Um, so th that's a lot of our focus. I, I don't want to get into the details or to rehash everything that we've said, but th the basic premise is um, that w we would be taking, the regulations would be taking um, what is now conditional use and uh, opportunity for public input as to whether a use is appropriate on a property and taking that away by making it a permitted use by right. So there's, uh, there's implications there for the potential for uh, developments of townhomes on R20,000 that are not compatible with adjacent communities. And uh, we think that relegating community input on whether these uses are permitted to only allow the community to input into the site plan um, is is not appropriate. So that's that's the nature of our comment, and we hope that there's further dialogue uh, to discuss uh, options to accomplish what the county wants to accomplish, but also keep the neighborhoods um, uh, in, intact and, and feeling compatible with the uh, the surrounding uh, developments. We've got a lot of um, uh, acreage, uh, probably about 450 to 500 acres that's ready for uh, development consideration that this uh, regulation change could affect. So that's uh, where we're at. I appreciate the opportunity to comment. All right, thank you so much. Um, so if we can unmute callers and if the next person who's unmuted can please state your name for the record. Yes, this is uh, Isaac Ambruso. Isaac, yes. Oh, am I am I going now? Is that, is that my understanding? Yes, please, Isaac, you're next. All right, wonderful. Um, okay, so my name is Isaac Ambruso. I'm uh, testifying on behalf of the Maryland Building Industry Association. Um, so I wanted to talk primarily uh, about our, expressing our support for the revisions to Chapter 155 and 158 for residential development. Um, you know, these individual lot minimums in the residential zoning categories um, allow us to, to put in place development pattern that allows, you know, usable lot sizes while, and it still provides open space and amenity areas, um, you know, through the use of cluster design. Um, you know, cluster design offers several major advantages over traditional design uh, from, you know, just purely from a financial uh, perspective. Um, it creates better community cohesion and puts people in better contact with their neighbors. It allows for more housing units to be serviced uh, on an individual roadway. So it, uh, uh, you know, it decreases the expense of road maintenance or potentially decreases the expense of road maintenance for the county. Um, so, it, it, it creates a more walkable community. It creates a more ho cohesive community um, and uh, allows us to build uh, enough enough units to uh, to account for for the people that want to that want to come live in Carroll County. Um, you know, it, it it also allows for the creation of more recreational areas and uh, ultimately just raises the quality of development. Uh, you know, throughout throughout a, a cluster development. Um, and uh, you know the other the other aspect of it is is over the past over 2020 and 2021, uh, you know we have realized uh, I think more starkly than uh, we could have predicted how important it is to be able to have uh, human contact in the event of a disaster, to be able to go talk to your neighbors, to have outdoor common spaces, um, to have places for your kids to go play so they're not trapped in the house. Uh, we don't know what the future is going to look like as regards schooling, as regards friendships, as regards um, you know, how people are going to be able to interact. So, you know, these kinds of developments um, create a community that's uh, in some ways more conducive to the post-pandemic world. Um, so on the final point, uh, you know, cluster developments 
also make adhering to uh, stormwater management practices much more e much easier and more attainable. Um, reduce lot sizes, allow us to provide space for environmental site signs um, to the maximum extent that we possibly can. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it allows us to, to, to adhere to the stormwater management requirements while still, uh, you know, creating or conforming to the, the residents' desire for open space. So we think that uh, a lot of the aspects of this plan are extremely important. And, and uh, you know, we want to thank uh, we want to thank you for, for the discussion and for the opportunity to be here. Um, and we do hope that you'll take these comments into consideration. All right, thank you so much. So if we can unmute the next caller, please, McQueen, give us your name for the record. Yes, good morning. Um, this is David Bowersox. All right, go ahead, Dave, thank you. Hi, I just wanted to confirm you can hear me, Linda. Good morning, everyone. I'm, I'm here, uh, here. I'm calling on behalf of uh, the Gerstel Academy uh, over 140 in the area between Westminster and Finksburg. It's my understanding that you have all received my letter dated February 24th, 2021, regarding the change of uh, private school private school uses from permitted uses in the R40 zone to conditional. Um, I'm not going to read my letter. Uh, the bases uh, that we expressed for the request that you make that um, permitted, in other words, keep it as the status quo, is to basically avoid the um, the implications of a non-conforming use situation. It was about two years ago when we started talking about the prospects of certain commercial uses being rendered non-conforming uses by the text amendments that were before you at that time. Um, those, those kind of negative uh, dynamics exist with regard to uh, the schools if they are to be rendered non-conforming by the proposed amendment. It's my understanding that the Economic Development Office has also weighed in on this. Um, we appreciate your consideration of our request. I don't see uh, answering a question I heard posed during the earlier discussion. I don't see a definition of a private school presently in the code. Um, so I, I don't believe there's one in your proposal now or any interest in uh, creating one. But in addition to the problems with a nonconformity, is to render this private school uh, a conditional use in that zoning district where public schools are permitted uses you wind up running into some implications, perhaps constitutional dimensions in terms of why public schools are being uh, allowed in a different way than a private school if the basic use of the property is just a school. Um, so that's one other benefit of keeping it status quo. Uh, that's really all I have. Um, thank you again for uh, entertaining our request. Um, and uh, I can be reached uh, if you have any questions. All right, thank you, Mr. Bowersox. Um, if the next caller on the line can state their name for the record, please. Uh, good morning. This is Matthew Polhouse. All right, go ahead, Matthew. Can you spell your last name, please? Uh, yes, ma'am. My last name is Polhouse. P is in Paul. O H L H A U S. Thank you. Of course. Um, so, good morning, uh, Matt Polhouse with Bowler. Uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity today, just to give my support of the residential zoning rewrite and proposed revisions to chapters 155 and 158 for residential development. Um, I've been a resident of Carroll County for almost my entire life and have been in the land planning and civil engineering industry for over 15 years now. Um, 
I think I'd like to start just by noting that in my opinion, many of these proposed revisions to these chapters, 158 especially, are not substantive changes, rather they're more an organization of the information and requirements that are already present in the regulations today. Uh, great work from staff so far with these updates, making these uh, more clear and, and understandable um, and following them through the code. A few of my remarks are, are really tying into the bulk requirements that we didn't get to today. Um, so maybe I'll leave you with a few thoughts to keep in mind while you prepare for the next meeting. Uh, and I'll be sure to turn into that one as well. But um, I know we've received feedback to date from the community that the requirement for the conventional plan has been removed from 155 uh, and potential implications that that might have. But I would like to point out that to balance that, the proposed rewrite establishes these minimum lot sizes that weren't present before. The minimum lot sizes provide limitations on the development that will help ensure community character. Uh, with the surrounding areas and then also beyond these lim minimum lot sizes, developments are still required to meet the other requirements of the regulations uh, and also comply with the latest stormwater management and environmental site design standards. Um, I was happy to see that the requirements of the cluster subdivision remain in place and mostly unchanged from the current regulations. Uh, there are many benefits to these cluster subdivisions. Uh, Isaac touched on them previously. Uh, but they do create more walkable, cohesive communities, but they also give us flexibility to provide and preserve the environmental sensitive areas that might be present on a given property and creating these useful open spaces. I think the last piece I'd like to touch on this morning is really with the addition of the ret um, retirement village in the R20 district. Um, while the regulations may allow for a retirement village to potentially have more units per acre on a given property than a single family development would, um, its impact to the infrastructure and the surrounding area, in particular to schools and traffic, is often less than what a comparable tr traditional single-family community would be. There's no impact to schools uh, as no new students are generated, and vehicular trips generated uh, from a senior housing type of use are roughly a third of that generated from a traditional single-family development. Um, so I guess with that said, I'd like to thank you all for your time this morning. Uh, respectfully request your support of the proposed residential zoning rewrite as we go forward, and I look forward to additional um, conversations with everybody. I have a right. uh, Matt, Matt's a, a resident of the county. Did he say that? Yes. Matt, where do you live? Uh, I, I live in, in Manchester at 5316 Hawthornville. There you go. Thanks very much. Yes, sir. Great, right. thank you, Matthew. Um, and I believe we have one additional caller on the line. You can state your name for the record. This is John McGuire. Can you hear me? We can, John. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I just am echoing uh, some of the thoughts that you've heard from others. Uh, Speaking on behalf of Lennar Homes, we have submitted uh, some detailed information, but uh, more conceptually, uh, we believe that the single family, two family and townhouse development for a retirement village in the R20,000 is, uh, is appropriate. Uh, and going back to uh, probably the 19, early 1970s, uh, when the county agreed uh, to submit in its ordinance the ability to do retirement housing uh, in the residential districts. Uh, it consulted with the state of Maryland, uh, the then Department of Aging folks, and it was uh, considered an objective to create housing for elderly people in a, in a residential setting uh, that was uh, promoting uh, mental health and uh, desirable for uh, aging people. Uh, these are people who want a peaceful community. Uh, these are people who are just seeking a residential use. So all of these uses are purely residential, whether they're single family, two family, or townhouse. Uh, we're talking about a residential use, which is why it is appropriate to be a permitted uh, use. And of course, I think we all know that there's an aging demographic that is driving up the demand for these uses. Uh, these will allow people to stay closer to the communities that they've uh, lived in and, and grown up in and closer to their families uh, to keep them in a, in a purely residential setting. Uh, the design of the retirement 
village is going to be uh, unique to senior housing. But for the most part, these, uh, as we've seen throughout the county, are pretty much sleepy uh, villages, very quiet, um, unassuming, and can make uh, reasonable uh, and unobjectionable neighbors. Uh, we've asked for uh, the ability of the Planning Commission to bump up the maximum density from 3.5 units to up to five units. That would be at the discretion of the Planning Commission under the given circumstances for the project. Uh, as you heard from one of the earlier speakers, uh, we think that that 3.5 unit density would compare to something along the lines of five units an acre for a retirement village. Um, given that the water and sewer demand is statistically about half of what it is for single family residential, the peak hour traffic is considerably less. There are no demands on schools. So, uh, that type of density would compare favorably with uh, with the single family. On the on the developer side, it allows for a broader housing mix, more affordable units, uh, an increase in the tax base for the county, and the pooling of more funds for the amenities of the project for long-term maintenance in years after the development or the developer may have moved on. And I would. Uh, conclude by uh, stating that the state code has a policy of at least 3.5 uh, units per acre density for the priority funding areas. So this would uh, allow the county to uh, meet the objectives in the state code. Uh, thank you for your time. All right, thank you, Mr. McGuire. And I believe that concludes all of the public on the line for comment at this time. Thank you. Um, so our next meeting will be a discussion of the cluster. Pretty in detailed discussion, I hope. Yes, correct. Yes, we'll have a very detailed discussion at our May 5th meeting regarding the cluster provision. And I believe that's the only agenda item that we have thus far. So we'll be able to dedicate time to this. And can you refresh um, the, the thing that John brought up reminded me when we have a priority funding area, the state of Maryland requires a certain density that in that priority funding area, correct? So for residential development, in order to be considered a priority funding area, it has to meet a density requirement of 3.5 dwelling units per acre. Um, and that is net, not gross. So if you had a cluster subdivision, let's say, and the built environment was at that 3.5. My understanding is that will meet the PFA requirement, but let's say the overall density of the property was two units an acre, that would still be okay because the built portion is 3.5. But if you have a two unit per acre subdivision that's new, spread out, it would not meet the PFA requirement. Um, and it has to be on water and sewer. So that's the other requirement as well. So you can't have just one or the other, it has to be both. And so for instance, on some of the properties we have in the Freedom Area that were expanded, we were not able to put the Zabel property in the PFA yet. If and when that property should develop, and if it develops under a cluster, and the density is that uh, net density of three and a half dwelling on the built portion, we would be able to apply for the priority funding area. And the priority funding area is approved administratively. Um, there's no real formal process. Um, as a matter of fact, we just added two properties in the Freedom Area to the priority funding area. Um, so the residential side is that three and a half dwelling units per acre and water and sewer. On the commercial industrial side, it has to be zoned commercial industrial and on water and sewer. So we were able to include the um, Delaney property, formerly known as the Delaney property that are owned by the Board of County Commissioners, which is just north of the property you saw today, 44 Liberty and the um, high school and elementary school, Century and Linton Springs. To the south side, there is a property that is zoned commercial that's now on water and sewer as well. Um, that is the Stavros property. That was also added to the priority funding area um, and that was administrative as well. 
Okay. Thank you, Linda. So our next meeting is our night meeting Wednesday, May 5th at 6 p.m. Any other comments from the commission? I so move that we adjourn. I, I'll, I'll accept that motion. <laughs> meeting adjourned. See you guys in a couple weeks. Thank you all. Bye.